Remember what we've been studying so far. We have a new existence. Am Yisrael, a month ago, established the holy home of Hashem called the Mishkan. And now, Hashem, 20 days before we're about to travel to the land of Israel, as we read in Bamidbar chapter 10, God orders accounting. And we learned about this counting in detail. This mifkad, everyone that's 20, every male 20 years and up will be counted. We saw the reasons that perhaps could serve as an understanding. Like Rashi says, this is the chiba, the love that Hashem wants. God is always counting Israel. Number two, we talked about that maybe there's a tendency for people to sense less value. And therefore, everyone counted has a lot of value. Everyone has kedusha. It's not just the klal that's holy, but even the prat, the individual that is holy. And third, we saw, from a strategic reason, if we're going to be traveling in 20 days, we must prepare ourselves for the war of mitzvah. In order to prepare yourself for war, you need an army. In order to have an army, logistically you have to know how many are you, how many divisions, how many platoons, and so on and so forth. Am Yisrael is getting ready. After we finish learning about the counting of all the tribes, excluding Levi, and we learned that Levi is in a different area. Levi will not be encamping like all the 12 tribes. Levi's role in the world is the Kodesh, the Mishkan. They're going to be surrounding the Mishkan like we saw and learned yesterday. We had illustrations of this as well. And then, as an intro to this chapter, please see Pasuk Nun Bet, verse 52. After learning about the three jobs, the three functions of Shevet Levi, you remember what they are. Taking apart the Mishkan and carrying it. Number two, protecting the Mishkan. And number three, reassembling the Mishkan. Those are the three jobs, functions that Shevet Levi is in charge of. And here, towards the end of the chapter, Pasuk Nun Bet, verse 52, V'chanu b'nei Yisrael, God says, and b'nei Yisrael shall camp, ish al machaneu, v'ish al diglo, letziv otam, for the first time, this word degel, <laughs> degel, which could mean a flag, but maybe it could mean something else right now. Every man, it seems, will have his machane and his dego. There are really those that want to explain that ish here, every tribe, the men of the tribe, not that each man will have his own dego, but every shevet, every tribe will have his dego. What the galim are we talking about? Rashi, in verse 52, Kimosha de galim sdurim besefer zeh. Just like the de galim are organized in this sefer. Would you please tell me where will we learn about the de galim? Where? In the next chapter. We're about to read it. Rashi is preceding. He's saying, we're going to learn about the Galim in the Sefer. Where? Which parak? Uh, Chapter 2. Okay, we have yet to see it. But here, it's written for the first time. Let me ask you, what could be the reason, as we're about to read Perak Bet, that God wants a tribe to have his own flag? What could be the reason? In, um, in, in, a sign, a siman, a semel. During the during war time, you, you, know, it's, you, you need to be able to identify who's who and who's where. So okay, so you're giving a logistic, a practical public. matter yes. that it too is a symbol or a sign for identity. What else? Morale. Morale. Pride ah, pride. Is. You belong to this. That's an interesting answer, Ariel. David. So later when they conquer Israel, they're gonna settle them 
with the tribe, so everybody needs to know where they belong to. So, they have to... so you're also talking about, like Amos and Moshe said, a symbol, a sign of identity. Cain, okay. Mr. Yisrael. <coughs> which is long Jewish word. This is Jewish word. Different. Every tribe will have a different sign. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, so you're going along with what he's saying. Ken Ariel? Um, also, just to um, uh, emphasize their strength. Emphasize each tribe, their strength. Each tribe's strength. So you're talking about identity, pride, strength. You know, Let's, you need, yes. You need cohesion. Because if you're talking about the. Um, so you're also talking about identity, but, well, more cohesion, more, unity. If you have the machni, the machni, machanot. Machanot. Then I'm thinking, but, but the machanot have several tribes in them. And so that you, you were trying to bring them together into one, into one fighting unit. As it okay, so you're all saying very similar things. Let's now together begin the new chapter. Perek Bet. Vayidabera Dunai El Moshe Viel Aaron Lemur. Ish, remember how I went to do explain the word ish? Not necessarily a man, but rather a, a, tribe. a tribe. Very good. A tribe. Chapter 2. Ish. Ish al diglo ve'otot levet avotam. Yachanu b'nei Yisrael. Mi neged. Follow the Hebrew. Mi neged saviv li ohel mo'ed yachanu. Before we get to the details of this obligation, this commandment, that every tribe, every ish, will have his degel. What is a degel? Let's say we're explaining that it indeed it does mean a flag. What's on the degel? Ve'otot. What ot? You all know that the word ot means a... Rashi, please look inside with me. Call degel yellow ot... Every dega will have a, I'm adding a word, a particular sign. Mapa tzvua tluyabo. There'll be some sort of cloth that will have a particular color. I'm continuing to read Rashi in Pasuk Bet. Tzvao shel zeh lo kitzvao shel zeh. Like some of you said, each one will have a different color. How, for instance, tzeva kol achad, follow the Rashi, the color will be like the variety of colors that we have as far as the Evan. What is Evan? Stone. The stone of the Choshen. Right? There was a particular stone for each tribe. Hey, what's the word? Put into the cavity. What's the word? Engraved. <laughs> Not engraved. The stone was inserted inside the breastplate. Called Avnei Hachoshen, the stones of the Choshen, and each and every tribe had a different color. color, had a different color. That color will now be on the Degel, and there'll be a sign. We're going to get to see a certain Midrash, Rashi, or some other matters. So, so far we know the following there's a commandment, every Shavit will have to have a flag which will bear a certain color and also they will be able to have, we're going to see according to the Midrash, they will have a particular symbol inside the color. Ruvain will be Dudaim. We'll talk about Yehuda. The Midrash calls it, he has an Aryeh, a lion, and so on and so forth. Rashi shares the logistic or practical matter that some of you said, each and every person shall be able to identify which Degel he comes from. Gentlemen, this is not just a simple... Relax, I'll get to you in a moment. Okay, then be jittery. Rashi explained us the logistic matter. Many of you directed your mind to this matter. I want to read you a Midrash Rabbah that I have in front of me. That the Midrash Rabbah says, this is great, this is a great sign of affection or love. 
that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has for His people. He made them like He made the angels. Malachi HaSharet. Just like the angels, it's stated in uh, the Midrash, they too have distinctive signs, as if Hashem knows how to identify them. And that's a sign of love. Each one is special. Each one has his individuality. Okay? Shlomo HaMelech, in Shira Shirim, in the Song of Songs, says in chapter 2, Pasuk Dalid, and some of you know the importance of Shira Shirim. First of all, where does Shira Shirim appear? Where does it appear in our Tanakh? It's in the scriptures, Ketuvim. There was debate, should it or not be inserted? Rabbi Akiva says, Shira Shirim is like Kodesh Kodeshim. Why? Because it's talking about something so unique that we have to ingrain in our minds and understanding. It's the ultimate love. It's a metaphor between a man and woman, but it's really the ultimate love between Hashem and Am Yisrael. The love of Hashem to Am Yisrael. A lot of metaphors, a lot of... There were, the, there were those that had fear. It sounds like it's too uh, immodest, talking about love between a man and a woman and so on and so forth. Rabbi Akiva says, and his opinion was accepted, Shira Shirim is like Kodesh Kodeshim. They took Rabbi Akiva's opinion, inserted it in the book of the Ketuvim. So we have, and it becomes one of five, Migilot, one of five Migilot, one which we'll be reading and learning, God willing, we'll have a shir on it on Shavuot, uh, Migilat Rut. Just I want to share you this pasuk. Shlomo Amelach says, "Heviani el Beit Hayayin." He brought me into the chamber. It says wine, but it means Torah. Vidiglo alai ahava. Diglo. Degel, Alai Ava. It says he clustered my encampment, my encampments about him in love. Degel doesn't mean here flag, but it's talking about his machane. Degel goes along with a machane. And it's here talking about love. Here in the Torah, God uses the language Degel. What does it mean that he brought me to the Beit Hayayin? Why do people translate this that's regarding the Torah? Gentlemen, at Sinai, when God appeared, revealed through prophecy at Mount Sinai, the Midrash shares with us in the oral Torah who appeared with God, who is part of his entourage. Many, many angels. 22 myriads. Remember the word we used yesterday, riva, va. 22 times 10,000. Was that 2.2 million? I don't know. 22 times 10,000 is 220,000. 22 times 10,000? Thank you. It's 220,000. That's the number the Midrash uses. Remember, when we learn Midrash, we're not learning pshat, simple meaning of the Torah. We don't have to understand everything in its simple manner. There's a lot of metaphorical understanding. There's a lot of symbolistic understanding. 22 myriads of 10,000s of angels appeared. Each and every one, the Midrash says, had their own degel. From there, there's a famous expression in the Tanakh, dagul merivava. Not Charles de Gaulle. Dagul Merivava. Flagged of the myriads. When Am Yisrael saw intellectually these hosts of angels, they began to have a spiritual desire for flags as well. When these thousands and thousands of angels appeared with Separate symbols, signs, flags. They said to themselves, the Midrash says, Halavai. What does Halavai mean? Could it be? Great would it be that we would also have flags like them. 
comes a Kadosh Baruch and says, What? Ish al diglo ve'otot levet avotam. Here, each and every tribe will have his flag. And we have to understand what's behind this idea. Some of you began saying, it's a symbol, it's identity, it's for practical purposes. Let's continue to read the Chumash, and then we'll hear some ideas together from you and myself. The Torah says, first of all, the Jewish people, when they're camping now, a month later after the building of the Mishkan, I want you to be living in and around, what is the Mishkan called here in this Pasuk? Quickly, what's the term? Oel Moed. Oel Moed. The tent of meeting. That's the Mishkan. Now, they're going to be living where? Mineged. Mineged doesn't mean close by. It means a distance. Chazal? Talk about approximately a kilometer away. The last camp. But we learned that you that Levi will be in and around the Oel Moed. So we, like we said yesterday... We're going to be learning about how many machanot? Three. The inner machane will be called machane shechina. The one surrounding the camp of divine presence will be called machane levia. The one surrounding machane levia will be called machane Yisrael. Yeah, we gave this out yesterday. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yuanawasa, I thought I'd save. It's okay. Now, what happens? Okay, I, I, I see you're bursting already. So, what do you want to say, sir? It's, it's been a while, man. <laughs> I wanted to say earlier, about ten or fifteen minutes ago, the translators of this gulash seem to agree with me that it's um, that the intent of them making the flags was for military purposes because they chose to use the words his own standard and with ensigns which are both mili- which which are both military terms uh-huh, okay. for describing the flags. Okay. So that thank you. So that goes along with the Rashbam and the Ramban's understanding that the major purpose for the counting is military, military reasons to get ready to go to war in 20 days. Something new is going to happen. We're going to be in motion. We're going to be in movement for the first time in almost an entire year. Something dynamic. That's something very new. Something very special is about to happen. We've got to get ready. Now let's see the entire situation. Pasuk Gimel. Vachonim keidma mizracha. Gee, couldn't the Torah just say those that are camping either in Kedem or Mizrach? Are in both words inferring east, Kedem. Remember, God promising eh, Avram Avinu, quote, Ufaratsta, Yama, Vakedma, Tzafona, Venegma. Did I just say a pasuk you don't know? I'll sing it. Ufaratsta, Ufaratsta, Ufaratsta. No one's joining me. Okay. Okay, so God promised Avraham Avinu you're going to spread out, you're going to grow in number. Yama, to the direction called. Yama, look at me, gentlemen. To the west, to the Yam. Kedma, to the Tzafona and Negba, south. So here the Torah says, those camping in Kedma Mizracha. So I heard a re- it's Lechora, unnecessary to say both Kedma and Mizracha. Answer. So there are those that say, by the way, which Degel are we talking about? Degel Machane Yuda. They're going to be the head of the camp in the east. Alongside them in verses 4 and 5, which two tribes? We learned about this yesterday. Who is joining, who's joining Yuda? And Zvulun. Look inside if you forgot. Yisachar and Zvulun. And it's going to be called which Machane? Yuda. Now, why Mizracha and Kedma? It's not to say Mizrach, the east. The answer is Kadima, Kedma, Kedem. They're the first. They're in front. Kedma has to be Kadima, to be in front. We're going to have four corners of the world. 
These camps we're about to learn for symbolizes Kisea Kavod, the holy throne of the Ribbono Shalolam, that he's surrounded by angels or wild beasts metaphorically on four sides because God created our world, the four dimensions. We have four dimensions in addition to up and below. So just like God's throne, the Midrash says, is surrounded by his entourage on four corners, so too the Machane Shechina, the presence of God's camp, the Mishkan, the Oel Moed, will be, well, a four Machanot. But who's first? Not the Machane of Ruvain. You would have thought he'd be first because he is Bechor, the firstborn. No, it'll be Yuda, because we know and we learned that Yuda has... He represents Malchut. And what about numbers are concerned? Who is the most populous of all tribes? Yudah 74, 600. Okay? So those that didn't get it, you give this to uh, that gentleman. Okay? So any others that wanted this one? So Yehuda will be the leader, Kedma Mizracha. Spiritually, Mizrach. Mizrach. Here, sir. Mizrach, east. Zoreach, shining. Light. Yuda represents the ultimate light of a nation of Israel. And therefore, he has to be in the Mizrach. So, too, the Mishkan. Uh, Mr. Architect, how do you go into the Mishkan? From which side? North? East? West? South? How do we go into the Mishkan? Very good. We go on the east side and we walk towards the west. That is the, what we learned in the book of Shemot. Okay? So who's at towards the entrance as if of the Mishkan? Yehuda. Together, like you said, with his two brothers, Yisachar and Zvulun. How much are they in number, these three tribes? 186-400. And now, Pasuk. We're now skipping to, uh, by the way, at the end of Pasuk Tet, traveling. It says, the last two words of the end of Pasuk Tet, Rishona Yisau. Remember, we read, we try to read the Chumash, understanding there are other things in front of us. We just can't be narrow sided. We're going to be traveling. There's going to be signs how to travel, there's going to be signals. If you blow the uh, trumpet this way, you tr trumpet that way. I'm, we're going to be traveling. Now, the Torah mentions it briefly. When we travel, who are the first ones to move? Rishona. They are the first ones to move. The Machane of? Yuda. Okay? Whereas, the next camp, Pasuk Yud, will be who, gentlemen? Degel, Machane. Which direction, please, the Torah says? No, in Hebrew. In Hebrew. What does it say in your Chumash? What do you have, a new edition? The New Testament, what do you have there? What does it say? Very good, Yisrael. Yisrael ben Avram. He had to fly all the way from Hong Kong to give you this answer. Okay? Teimana. Are you, te are you Teimani? <laughs> Certainly not. Teimana. Okay, look at me. What's the word we just read? Teimana. Look at me, Mr. Adler. Yeah, sure. Teimana. Take off the tough. Yamin. 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 Oh, okay. Remember, we say this often in our shirim in Tanakh. When we learn directions, learning in Tanakh, the directions are that our back, our back is to the west, the direction that you gentlemen are sitting. Your back right now is to the west. You're facing... East to the right is south, south. south. Yamin will be south. Turn around. <laughs> so make sure you understand what's going on. <laughs> Turn around. There you go. Yamin is to the right is the south. Okay. Yamin is south. Interesting. Reuven, together with two brothers of their tribes, which which two? Why do we have two different answers? Ruvain is the Bechor, the son of 
Leah, his brother, second, Shimon. And, well, Levi is not going to be included here because he's camping somewhere else. So who did God assign to be next to Reuven and Shimon? Which tribe? God. Because we said he's the Bechor of? Of the right, the the shivcha, the uh, maid servant of Leah. So they're going to be in the south. By the way, which of the three eventually will be settling in the south? In southern Eretz Yisrael, Shimon. Very good. Shimon will be living indeed in the south. Okay, how many are they? This camp. 151, four, well, you count real fast, gentlemen. 151, 450. And uh, what about traveling? What does the Torah say? What does the Torah say as far as traveling is concerned? Ushniim, do you see that? Ushniim, Yiso, in the end of verse 16. Ushniim, from the word? Shani? Shani, Shneem, they will be seconds to travel. Now, I want to just stop here. Uh, I want to read. No, no, I want to read the next passage, verse 17. What happens now? What appears now in the Chumash? The third Degel? No. No. It seems that there's a break. And we learn now about Machane. Levim? We're now learning here about Machane Levim and not what? Uh, and not what? Yeah, Yishai, you're welcome to have a place here. Uh, what? And not about which Degel? A fry. Who's going to be forthcoming and uh, treat Yishai with a, uh, a chumash? You couldn't bring something bigger in water size, Yishai? He has a chumash there. Okay. What, what, David Adler, what would you have thought the Torah would have gone to right now? The third machaneh, the third camp. Good point. So we're asking ourselves, why now is Ol uh, the Ol Moed talked about, and it's called which machaneh? Machaneh Levim. Machaneh Levim. That's question one. Question number two. I want to ask you, how really will it be when the time comes? And the cloud rises. How do we travel? As far as, okay, you, you packed your Samsonite luggage, fine. You saw the cloud rising. How do we travel? How, who, who, what does it mean that they're the first to travel? Machane Yuda. What does it mean that Machane Uvein is number two? That's quite, how, how, how would they do? What do you mean they're the first and they're second? How, well, one after the other. You're saying in a line? Is that what you mean? Okay. Mr. Amos holds like the Yerushalmi that's brought in a Rashi. Uh, where did I see it? It's brought in a Rashi later on. Um, one second. Pasuk uh, Tet. Okay. There are going to be two opinions. How we travel. But before I recite or explain the second opinion, that you, the opinion that you just said, Amos, look and read together with me verse 17, Pasuk Yudzayin of chapter 2. Do you have a chumash, sir? Yes. Good. So, Perek Bet, Pasuk Yudzayin, Menachem, yes, would you please read? Yes, I'm reading. Venasa ohel mo'ed, machane halvim betocha machanot. Kasher yachanu, kein yisao. Ish al yado. There's a problem understanding this Pasuk because it says that just like they camped, so too do they travel. I repeat, Kasher Yachanu, Kain Yiso. Do these words suggest what Amos explained? Yes or no? Why not? Because it says in a line, like first there's Yuda, then Ruven, then the Levim. But it's actually uh, Yehuda, Ruven, then the Levim, uh -huh. then the South. Very interesting. Very nice. So you directed your mind to one of the two opinions that uh, Rashi brings. Uh, please see together with me Pasuk Tet, verse 9. You explained it very well. Okay, David? You deserved, you know, 
buy yourself a coffee or something like that. Rishona Yisa, oh, Rashi says, and I'm reading verse 9 in the Rashi, if you have a Rashi, please. If not, find it by your neighbor. Kisharoim Ha'anan Mistalek. Rashi tells us what's going to be up ahead, chapters in front of us, right? When the cloud rises. Gentlemen, we're not sitting on a university campus and taking a knife and ripping apart the chumash from just analyzing this and this only. What does King David say in Psalms? Torah Tashem Timima Meshivat Nafesh. The Torah of God is complete. Rav Tzudah Kuk would say, the last two words, Meshivat Nafesh, it restores, it uplifts the soul. When is it uplifting the soul? When you treat the Torah in a complete way and not like in a laboratory where you are, what is the word where they're dissecting. dissecting things and taking things apart, regardless of other matters of the Torah. We approach the Torah of a wholesome approach. So Rashi already is teaching us, he's educating us. When we learn Torah, let's not be narrow sided and just look here and here only. When the Torah says they're the Degel Machane Yehuda is the first one to travel. Travel? Well, how do we travel? I didn't get up to that page. It's the first time I'm reading the Torah. Rashi says, no sweat, follow me. Rashi says, in Pasuk Tet, Kishiroim Ha'anan Mistalek. Rashi fills, uh, what question was Rashi asking? Remember, so Rashi's a science. Rashi doesn't bother writing the question. What is his question though? Read again the first words of Rashi in verse 9. Kishiroim Ha'anan Mistalek. When you see the Anan removed, going up, meaning, what's Rashi's question that he's answering? When, you... when do you travel? Rashi's asking when or how, through what system? That's what he's asking. Answer, when the Anan, when the cloud that's right now hovering over the entire nation. Remember, our camping of Israel, the theme of this chapter is the presence of Israel together with the presence of God. It's one entity. The theme of this chapter. Yes. It's the Machaneh Shechina together with Machaneh Yisrael. Right? The camp of God. God's encampment. Camp, God's what? Encampment. encampment. Together with Israel's encampment. It has to be a divine order. There's a divine order how we camp. And now we're starting to learn there's a divine order how we travel. It's going to be written in another place. But Rush is bringing it here. How do you know what the, when to travel? Answer. When? What's the word for cloud? Anan. Anan. Then, let's continue reading the Rashi. Tokim Koanim. Okay. Tokim Koanim. The Koanim will be doing. Of what? What? Very good. Made out of which metal? No, silver. 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 We're going to learn a thing. It's about Midbar chapter 9. Quote, Asei lecha chatzotzrot kesef. Make for yourselves a trumpet made out of silver. That will be the instrument. Tokim. What is Rashi suggesting? What type of sound? No. Tokim. No. Tekiah. Very good, Yishai. A tekiah. One straight blast. Unbroken. Tekiah. Since no one, you know, clapped or whatever, I won't do it again. Okay. I have one fan sitting back there. Thank you. Uh, okay, is it kia? Bachatzotzrot. When that happens, v'noseh machane yudat chila. Rashi, does he hold like Amos holds? It says Rash machane yuda will begin traveling, and then Rashi says ukshalchim, and when we go holchim kedere chaniyatam. We will travel just like we Camp. camped. And now Rashi says, Halavim va'agalot ba'emtza. The Levim and the wagons. What wagons? Where were their wagons of the Mishkan? That's also up ahead, not here. Remember? We learned. No, we didn't learn about it, did we? No. It's going to be also later in Parshat in Nassau. Princes will come on day number one after seven days of inauguration. Day number eight, 
And each tribal leader will come with a gift. And one of the gifts is that every two tribes will get together to bring a agala. What are they thinking about in advance? We're going to be professional schleppers, huh? We're going to be, we, we, we need wagons to transport parts of the Mishkan. We'll get to that, God willing, next week. Bezrat Hashem. So the Levim and the Agalot, the wagons in the middle. Dego Yuda ba Mizrach. Shoru vein ba Darom. Vishel Ephraim ba Mara vishel da Mitzafon. Is this going according to what you thought, Amos? No. no. This is like David Adler explained, right? The way we will travel is the way we camped. That's one opinion. I just want to explain what Amos thought. I told you it's a Yerushalmi. I see now the source in front of me. It's in Perak Yud. If you want to quickly skip to chapter 10, verse 25, Pasuk Kaf hey. Chapter 10, Pasuk Kaf Hey. Rashi brings a Talmud Yerushalmi. Again, Perak Yud, chapter 10, Pasuk Kaf hey, verse 25. Ma'asef lechol machanot. He is the the last one to travel. Who will be the last one to travel? Done. It'll be done. Very good. Rashi brings on verse 25 in Rashi, chapter 10. What page is it in this linear? Did anyone find it yet? Chapter 10, Yud. Perak Yud. Anyone find it in this uh, edition? It's uh, Thank you. Thank you. 97, 98. I'm reading Rashi. lechol ha-machanot tamud Yerushalmi. Dan was a very populous tribe. How much was he? Ah, the entire... One second. Dan was 62. Right, but Dan was 62, 700. He was a very large tribe, just a little under Yehuda. Was he the second most uh, populous? Yes. So since they were most populous, they were used for very... Major job, lost and found. When you're walking in the desert, you know, this pops out of here, this, this, the kid, your kids jumped, this fell, you went down to tie your shoes, or did we have shoes? So they were be the last ones. Rashi says, Anyone that lost things done would bring it back. I'm skipping to the end of Rashi. There are those that say, Kikora. We traveled like a kora, like a beam, meaning in one long row, in one long row. How did I learn it out? It says the tribe of Dan was the collector for all the tribes. If we're walking like we camped, can they really pick up lost items on all sides? No, because there, because there were those uh, a kilometer this way, those a kilometer that way. Yeah. But if we say they traveled like a kora, like a beam, then easily they'll be able to pick up any lost objects. That's sourced in the Talmud Yerushalmi. So we have two opinions: how we traveled, and it's all based upon the understanding of the words. Is it a, 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 what were the words? A, um, uh, can you so, what is it? Can you so? The way we camped is the way we traveled? Is that the emphasis? Or is it that Dan was the collector of all lost items? Two opinions in Chazal that Rashi brings here. Questions or comments about that? David Bradley? The, uh, I just want, I want to modify what I said about those before the flags is we're learning. It's command and control. <laughs> because as we're moving, how do. How do you know who's already moved? You can't tell looking at a crowd. Right. If you see their day go, you That's can say, very ah, good. Excellent. 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 What about the, the Levine? So the now let's get, it's exactly where we're coming back to. Thank you for the uh, system of getting back. In verse 17, we're back in our chapter, chapter 2. We're learning that here in the order of the Psukim, mm -hmm. after the traveling of Yudah and after the traveling of Machane, Ruvain, third is the Ohel Moed, the Holy Mishkan, which is called, and it's going to be taken by Machane Halevim. It's going to be taken by Machane Halevim. So if we say, according to the Yerushalmi, Amos, that we went like a beam, the first camp is 
The second camp is Ruvain. And now the third camp is the Machane Levim. That's how we can understand it so far. Okay? Next, verse, camp number three of Israel. Which is it? Ephraim. Ephraim. Would you please tell me? Ephraim is in which direction? West. West. The wording of the Torah for West? In the desert, there's a yam. In the desert, there's a yam. Let's go. Let's go swimming, guys. What? So the the directions are reflecting a nation living in its land. In in Eretz Yisrael, we have the Mediterranean, and it'll be termed as the yam. Okay. So the directions here are reflecting a yam. My question to you is the following: Which way? is the Torah going, starting from Mizrach, and then going to Darom, and now going to Marav. Which direction is it going? East. East. Yeah. I'm asking again, which way are we going? Which way is it presenting the camps? Clockwise? Not clockwise? Again, we're starting with the Machana East, then we went to the South, and now we're going to the... What direction is this? Clockwise. It's clockwise, or going to the right. Yeah. To the right. We're looking at the east. Our back is to the west. Mizracha, Daroma, and Marava. Is it by mere incidence? Without, not dealing with politics here. We're dealing, going to the right. The Talmud says, and we're quoting... Everywhere you turn, turn to the right. Eliav is sitting right now in the middle of the synagogue. And the Gabai calls him up to the Torah. And the Bima is that way. <clears throat> Which way would he approach the Bima? From the right side. Shulchan Aruch. Why? We do everything towards the right. Right symbolizes chesed. Left symbolizes din. We're talking about God's kindness, God's love to Am Yisrael. He's counting us. He loves us. He's about to bring us into the land of Israel. We're about to travel within 20 days from now for the first time of being stationary for almost one entire year. So even the ways presenting the Machanot, the camps of Israel, it's with chesed, to the right. Do you follow? Okay. So now, the third Machanot of Israel, he said, is Ephraim. Look at me. Ephraim, this will now be a camp of which great leader of the tribes? I'm waiting. Yosef. We're talking about Yosef. Yosef is prized. He's talented. He became... The viceroy of, of Paro's Egyptian empire. He saved the empire economically from devastation. Right? So he becomes special. There's a prophecy to Yaakov Avinu. Okay? Ephraim u'menashe ki reuven v'shimon yuli. This is not uh, the idea, the fathoming of, of Yaakov Avinu. God gave a prophecy that Ephraim and Asher will be equal to a Reuven and Shimon. And therefore, Yosef's representation is a double representation here, above and beyond Ruvain. Ruvain lost some of his greatness by him flunking out in, in, in an event that happened that we learned in Sefer Breshit. So we have Dega Machan Ephraim. Again, who's, who's alongside Ephraim, he said? Minashe and Binyamin. Those are the three. We talked about yesterday that Menashe is the least populous of all tribes. One, uh, except one uh, understanding we gave yesterday, he's a generation later than the others, less people. Maybe, uh, let's just leave it at that right now. Okay, the fourth Degel and the last Degel here is Degel Machane Dan. Tzafona. Tzafona. Dan. He'll be the leader. Alongside him will be who? Asher and Naphtali. Remember in the Tanakh, the geographic area of Shevet Dan. Okay? 
No, let's start from the beginning. Okay, you're you're the traffic reporter for Machon Meir news station, and you're saying that the traffic report in Gush Dan. Wow, so the highway is almost like a parking lot. What is Gush Dan today? It's where you study. Tel Aviv, Petach Tikva, Bnei Brak, one of the most what populated. most populous populated areas of the country. The most What's the word I'm looking for? It's a full, very crowded areas. Okay? Don did not like everything that he had. He was looking for more areas. And he sent up spies up north towards the Hermon. He found some sort of Canaanite entity, uh, like Luft mentioned, people with their feet in the air. And he caught them when they were not watching. And he took over the area, which later becomes the Hermon area. The river underneath the Hermon today is called the Dan River. The Dan River. Because Dan was... So Dan has a split inheritance. The Petach Tikva, Kfar Saba, whatever, uh, Bnei Brak, Tel Aviv area. And up north, up north in the upper Galilee, can the Etzba Galil. Remember, we mapped it out. One side is a Syrian border. The other side is a Lebanese border. Very difficult border to secure. We suffered a lot in the 1970s when the Hezbollah Yamach Shamam were rocketing us and, and Jews were living in fear and living in, in, uh, in shelter areas and so on and so forth. Interesting. Dan, who represents Din, it says Dan Yadin Amo so one of the blessings, I don't remember, I'm sorry, if it's, was it Yaakov's blessing or was it Moshe's blessing? Remember, prior to the passing away of Yaakov Avinu and Moshe Rabbeinu, they issued brachot to each of the 12 tribes. So one talks about Dan is Din. In fact, the symbol on his map will be a scale. Okay? Will be a scale. Because the scale represents judgment, represents Din. Furthermore, your Mio. When he talks about uh, the bad prophecies of the land of Israel being conquered by foreigners, he says, and I'm quoting, Mitzafon tipatach hara'a. I repeat, Mitzafon tipatach hara'a. It's yours, I remember. Okay, and from the north shall the evil come, shall the bad come, the attack. And indeed, the Babylonians and others Aram, Nara, Aram, and so on, Aram, Syria, Aram, Damascus, they come from the north. So it's interesting that the Machane of Dan, it too, is in the north. He's leading them. And who are the last ones to travel? Who are the last ones to travel? Look in the Tanakh. Look in the Chumash. Find the Pasuk. No, find the pasuk to teach me that the, this machane is the last ones to travel. It's written explicitly. Pretty one. And these counts, it's sort of again, from one or one hundred. Et cetera, they shall travel last. Lachro. Look at the last three words in Hebrew, everyone. Lachrona yisu lediglehem. Lachrona yisu lediglehem. What do you want to ask? So these, the numbers of the populations of the tribes here. This is uh, the numbers at the time of the encampment in 11 months and 20 days, right? In right now, we are almost one year after the giving of the two tablets, the Ten Commandments at Sinai. This is the time that's happening. We're about to move in 20 days. The, we're, it could be in 18 days, 17 days. We don't know exactly how many days it took for Moshe, Aaron, and the assistance of the 12 leaders to uh, did it take whatever. We're right now about to move. Is this in the 11 months and 20 days? Definitely? Yeah, No, it's after the 11 months, of course. The beginning of the parsha opens up with the commandment to do this on the first day of the second month. That's what we learned before. My dear friends, after reading about four machanot, the Torah tells us, the last three psukim, please follow me. These are the numbers. The same number that we saw at the end of the previous chapter, but now we have a camping system. And we know that the camp of Israel has holiness. It's camping around the Shekhinah. It's camping around the Levim. And we're told again in verse 33, They were not 
count it because they're a separate entity. They're the legion of, of Hashem. As we read in Rashi, the legion of God. God's special legion, his special company. Okay? They're going to be camped. Not betoch b'neisa, but as we're going to learn, they're going to be counted. I'm sorry, they're going to be counted separately. And then we learn about the movement. My dear friends, so let's just go back and understand what's happening here. Flags, colors, insignias of each and every tribe. Everyone's carrying a different color, like the color of the stone on the heart, on the chest of Aaron when he's carrying the Choshen Mishpat. And the Midrash tells us exactly the oral Torah, the special flowers that Ruvain took are the insignia of Ruvain. Shimon has the special color called Pitida, and it had, its special color was very green, and what was on it was the city of Shechem, because Shimon, together with Levi, overtook the city of Shechem after their sister being raped, Dina. Levi had a bareket, not barekas, a bareket, and that was a third white, a third dark, and a third red. And Levi stone had the urim vitumim. That would be on the flag of the tribe of Levi, and so on and so forth. Many great scholars analyze this. One, a great rabbi Scheinberg, who used to be a Rosh Yeshiva, and a, so like an American, an Israeli Yeshiva, and Romema, it's a very famous rabbi, he used to wear dozens and dozens, dozens of a bigadim of tzitzit he would wear. He says the following. Remember, metaphorically, each angel had his own flag. Each angel had his own tafkid. Each angel had his own shlichot, his own mission. When you have your mission, and it's clear to you, and David, you have your mission to do, and it's clear to you, you're not envious or jealous of him, and vice versa. There's less competition. There's less budding in in your job and you budding in in his, his job. Why did the nation of Israel have this lust, this spiritual desire to be like angels and have these flags, have these colors? Because we want to really take and invest our energy, our talents, our abilities to do what I have to do. You, David, you're not that David. And this David is not that Moshe. And Amos, you're not Ariel. And Ariel is not Noam. And Noam is not Yishai. And Yishai is not uh, uh, Mr. Tiveria. And so on and so forth. When you know who you are, and you know what your job is, wow, that is the ultimate unity. There are some that thought, I have to be like you. You have to dress like him. You have to move your body in Shimon Esri just like he does. And everyone does not have his uniqueness. Here, the Torah is teaching us a different matter. God doesn't want you to be like him, nor you to be like him as well. You have to be yourself. You have to realize who you are, what is your great inner identity, what are your special unique talents, and by doing so, you're going to come closer to God. We have to respect each and every one. The beauty is that you don't dress like him and you don't pray like him and therefore you honor him. The uniqueness is that everyone is unique. Everyone is different. Everyone is special. Each tribe had a different flag. That flag is teaching us it has a different color, a different insignia. That means the unity of the Jewish people is not everyone doing the same thing. Of course, it's everyone serving Hashem. Yes, we're all putting on to fill in. Yes, we're praying to one God. But you have your colors. You have your shades. You have your uniqueness. Okay? You have your internal powers, the kochot nefesh. Your kochot nefesh that you have are different than him. Your, your inner powers and talents that you have are different than he has. Every group is different. Every individual is different. And when we march forward carrying this banner, realizing that we all have a shlichut in this world. We all have a mission in this world. 
And your mission is going to be different than his. And his mission is going to be different than yours. In and around Shulchan Aruch. In and around serving the same God. But we don't have to be alike. Rather, we have to, we're all different. And that's the beauty of the Jewish people. The beauty of the Jewish people is that we're all different. We have to respect that. Let's now bring it down from a macro level to a micro level. When you're going to be married to your dear wife, I'm sorry to tell you, she's not like you are, and you are not like she is. You're two different worlds. Really? But you, you were looking for the same act. You're not the two or the same. You're not two. And therefore, we have a new arithmetic. When you respect your wife, and she respects you. You understand who she is, that she's not you. And she understands you, that she's not you as well, and you're not her. Then we have a new arithmetic. That I don't know if the Board of Ed approves of it. One plus one equals one. That'll be the ultimate unity. When you respect your neighbor, your friend, of course your wife, and you realize the differences in the character traits, in the kochot nefesh, in the different features the other person has, and you don't always look upon and criticize what's lacking in the other person. Okay? I think it was the Alta Rebbe or the Balatanya would say, do you know, HaKadosh Baruch Hu had he wanted, he could have created man with one eye. With one eye would have been sufficient. And maybe you would have peripheral vision. I don't know. God would create something that you can move the eye to the right, to the left, up and down, and all these things, just like you can move your eyeball to different directions. So why do you have to trouble us with two eyes? You know, we could have saved so much money in optical cost during the, the centuries and so on and so forth. And he says the following. People make a mistake. And they often use one eye to scrutinize, to criticize, and see what's lacking by your neighbor, your friend, and God forbid, even your wife. And often with the other eye, I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm not missing or lacking anything. I'm 100%. I'm meachuz. That's a, a false understanding, the Balatanya says. He says, with one eye, we should try to examine ourselves. Try to see, what do I have to do to become a better person? What do I have to do to become a better chavruta, a better rebbe, a better husband, a better brother, a better sister, and so on and so forth? And with the other eye, let's try as much as possible to praise the other person, to give him honor, to give him respect. Wow, that was a great thing you did. Well, you, you asked really good questions in sure, That's fantastic. Oh, thank you for bringing me the paper here and doing this. And well, thank you for publicizing this on the, on the group chat. Ken Hirsch always uh, takes the, uh, the uh, initiative to post a lot of things for students that they know what's going on. Shekoch, Hirsch, and you're caring for so, much, for so many people and so on and so forth. Maybe that's one of the lessons that you and I can learn from the idea that unity stems from not being doing wearing the same thing and being the same thing but that respecting the differences every tribe had a different mapa had a different degel had a different color had a different mission they saw what their essence is on there and and therefore that's the beauty and matters of here mr uh, uh ken erinstein <laughs> ravid uh, could you do me a favor? I would like to, if I can. Could you repeat uh, what you just tell us, told us about the uniqueness, uh, what uh, Hashem gives us? God. It's something very special. Okay, so let, let, let's just understand. When we learned about the 12 tribes, and we learned about their essence by Moshe Rabbeinu's blessing and Yaakov Avinu's blessing, we see by the blessings of Yaakov Avinu and Moshe prior to their death, each tribe gets a unique, different blessing. That's representing what's deep down in their soul. That's representing what's their unique mission in the world, like Yehuda. Yehuda re re relates to authority, to leadership, kingdom. Whereas Yisachar, Chamor Goren, his bones are strong like a... Like a Chamor. What did Chazal talk about the strong bones of a chamor? To sit in the yeshiva and learn Torah. It's not like, you know, learning in uh, Tulane. Uh, two four years and getting a, a degree in four years. It's, yeah, 
that was you know it was a little difficult here and the, to learn Torah year after year, month after month, day after day. Wow, that requires strong bones. It requires strong desire. Yisachar had that ability. Zvulun, on the other hand, he's camping along the shores with his ships. He was a great merchant. He was a great businessman. He would be able to take and materials from the land of Israel and export to the Indian Ocean. I don't know where other civilizations. And you know what? They made an, they made an agreement together. The Talmud says they made a partnership. Okay, Yisachar studying Torah and Zvulun is supporting him. And Zvulun will get some of the reward of the Torah study. So this is just in brief. If we want to understand more, we'll open up to the end of Parshat Vayechi, the end of Breshit, chapter 40, if I'm not mistaken. Is that? And also in chapter 33 of Deuteronomy, we'll learn about the blessings. There we learn about the special missions, the special characteristics. We have to stop here. We'll continue with this short God willing tomorrow. Have a great day today, gentlemen. Shalom uvracha. Rabbi. Uh,